Dr. Nicholas Freudenberg is Distinguished Professor of Public Health at the City University of New York Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy. He's the director of the CUNY Urban Food Policy Institute and founder of Corporations and Health Watch, a website that monitors the impact of corporations on health. His research examines the impact of food and social policies on urban food environments and health inequalities. He is the author of more than 100 scientific articles and the author or co-author of, I believe it's six books, including 2014's Lethal But Legal Corporations, I'm sorry, Lethal But Legal Corporations, Consumption and Protecting Public Health. His work has been supported by the NIH, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and the Open Society Institute. Mark Bittman is a food journalist, author, and former New York Times columnist. He's been a leading voice in global food culture and policy for more than three decades. He's written or co-written 30 books, including the How to Cook Everything series. In addition to numerous publications and television appearances, he has hosted or been featured in four television series, including Showtime's Years of Living Dangerously and On the Road Again with Gwyneth Paltrow. Mark and Nicholas each have terrific new books just released, so we're here to, tonight to host kind of a dual interview. I guess folks call that a conversation. At any rate, the interview is about Nicholas Freudenberg's At What Cost, Modern Capitalism and the Future of Health, and Mark Bittman's Animal, Vegetable, Junk, A History of Food from Sustainable to Suicidal. Please join me in welcoming Mark Bittman and Nicholas Freudenberg. Thank you all so much for uh, joining us tonight. We look forward to talking about our books and to hearing your thoughts and questions. Uh, I'll get started uh, maybe by asking you a question, Mark, uh, about your new book. You've been writing about food and, and then food policy for quite a while. Uh, tell us a little bit about what made you move from writing cookbooks to writing this really comprehensive long history of how humanity deals with food. What, what took you to that place? Well, um, when I started writing about food, uh, food writers wrote recipes. Um, historians wrote, historians and agricultural writers wrote about the bigger issues around food, but there wasn't a lot of that. And, um, and frankly, I don't think I had the imagination or the education to write about food um, other than recipes, enjoyment, travel, ingredients, cooking, and so on, um, until about 20 years ago when other people started doing it and I started seeing uh, the impact our agricultural system and, and our, our way of eating had on our health and, and how those were declining. And um, I was fortunate enough to be at the times where uh, you were allowed to write about new things, <laughs> which was great. Um, and eventually began to write about much more serious aspects of, of food. And um, like almost anything you learn about, it was eye-opening. And the more I did it, the more I wanted to do it. And, and finally um, asked, uh, the editors at the Times, if I could write weekly about food in an opinion column, and, and I had to do some convincing for that to happen, but it did. Um, and I, be I became frustrated with the weekly column format because when you write 800 or 1,000 words at a time, you remember what you did last week, six weeks ago, 10 weeks ago, 15 weeks ago, and it feels as if you're putting together something comprehensive. But your audience doesn't often remember that and, and sees each column as a snapshot, which there's, there's usefulness around that. But I was frustrated because I felt that there was a bigger story to tell. And so five years ago, six years ago now, I left the Times and I started working on what became Animal Vegetable Junk. And I really didn't intend to write a history, but... Um, As I looked at the 20th century, um, I realized I had to, I couldn't explain it without looking at the 19th century and I couldn't explain that without looking at the 18th century and so on. And in the first draft of the book, I really, I began talking about the beginning of time, which was a little extreme. Um, and then I, I shrank the, the scale to a more human one. And I, you know, the, the distant, the ancient history of food and humans is, is interesting. And, and the 10,000 years since agriculture was, uh, began is interesting. But what's really, what's really important 
And what really grabbed me is the last 500 years, the years since, uh, let's say, the, the era of capitalism is probably the easiest way to put it. And, and so I, I spent a lot of time learning and, and writing about that. And then, and then I got into where we are around food, which is a story that, that I knew pretty well. And then I, spend, I spent some time talking about where we ought to be going around food, which I, I'm sure you and I will get to tonight. So there's no need to say that now. But, you know, to, to just literally tackle your original question, I would, I would say that I think that, that food is underrated. If you, can, if you can say that something that people talk about all the time and, and everybody thinks about several times a day, and many people claim they're always thinking about their next meal and there's no reason not to believe them, it's, it's still, we are so alienated um, from food and how it's grown. And I think that, that you and I are the same age, Nick. I think that our grandparents were really probably the last generation where people, most people knew farmers. And maybe it even goes farther back than that. Most people in the United States knew, knew farmers. And in the last 7,500 years, we have become further and further distanced from how food's, how food's grown, how it's produced, and then increasingly how it's processed or over-processed. And I think people have, don't ask the simplest questions about food, like what is food for? Why are we producing it? What should we be doing food-wise? And I think the book is, is, is an opportunity for people to consider food seriously, to, to think about why it should be taken more seriously and why we should ask you know, that most fundamental question, what is food for? And so and your book really, uh, food takes us everywhere, right? It takes us to labor, it takes us to the environment, it takes us certainly to farming and agriculture, it takes us to cities. Uh, I, I, I really like the way that you made all those connections. Well, I think, you know, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna talk a little bit about you for a second, um, I think that what I admire, admire about you and and did before I knew you was that you made those connections very early on and um, and earlier on than most people did, and I, we obviously I don't need to I don't need to affirm that we both agree that. Um, one of the biggest questions, the, the broadest question you you could ask is, is what does public health mean or, or what is the public health? Um, and food is a big part of that. And I, I've chosen, obviously, I've had the opportunity to do it this way, but I also have welcomed it, chosen to address big public health issues um, through the lens of food. But you've, you've gone a slightly different route and, and your food work has been great, but you've you've tackled things in a bigger way and you really have looked at capitalism, corporate power, public health, not only through the lens of food, but through the lens of uh, big tech, through healthcare, through transportation, through urban issues and so on. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit um, about the history of behavior of, of multinational corporations in these various sectors, how they compare to food, how they compare to each other, what they have in common and, and what they don't. Sure. So I think in this uh, latest book I wrote, uh, At What Cost, Modern Capitalism and the Future of Health, uh, the, the reality is the last few years, all of us, have been watching these public health apocalypses unfold. Uh, most recently, the COVID-19 pandemic, but also the climate emergency, uh, you know, uh, 30 storms in 2020, uh, huge disruptions on the Atlantic coast, the Pacific coast and the Caribbean with, you know, really uh, devastating health and economic consequences. Uh, deaths of despair, the concept that uh, Anne Case and Angus Deaton write about, the deaths of primarily white 
less educated folks, heavily related to working conditions, but also to opioids, alcohol, and firearms. Uh, and of course, the ongoing uh, disparities in deaths among uh, people of color and whites that we've seen uh, focused attention on. And I wanted to understand what's the common cause of those things? You know, what is it that is creating this cascade of public health uh, crises uh, in, the, in the 21st century? So, so you took a really long view. My starting point was the capitalism we see today, the 21st century capitalism. And I think as a public health researcher and advocate, I wanted to understand how changes in capitalism, the increasing uh, control of the corporate economy by global corporations and their global trade in uh, unhealthy commodities, in, uh, in financial instruments, the growth of the financial sector, uh, leading employers to cut wages, to put people in a much more precarious, uh, employment status, the development of the gig economy, uh, big tech, you know, looking, finding a way to make money for it by selling the most personal information about us to advertisers. Uh, and, and I think striking in both food and other sectors uh, is the increasing control of science and technology by corporations, you know, uh, used not to benefit humanity, the you know the enlightenment notion of science, but to but to increase the bottom line of corporations. And I think we've seen uh, what what you write about and observe in your book around food. I also found in the pharmaceutical industry, in big tech, uh, in transportation, where you have companies like Uber and Lyft really fairly actively trying to destroy mass transit so that they can capture that market. Uh, and, and here are companies taking actions to benefit their bottom line that end up undermining public health because probably mass transit is one of the most healthy uh, characteristics. This is uh, before the pandemic, but even will be under control again soon, encouraging walking, reducing pollution and so on. So I'm trying to understand how the changes in capitalism lead to health problems and then like you, and what can we do about it? It's interesting. Um, I, I did an interview this afternoon and got the, got the question that you often get uh, when you're talking about food and how to do agriculture differently. And the question was, um, the question is, can we feed the world without industrial agriculture. Um, and I, without being, without being insulting, I, I tried to say that the, the question is the wrong, the wrong question. And it shows a sort of lack of imagination because it's similar to saying, can we move from one place to another without having a hundred million cars in the United States or whatever, whatever the number is. And, and, I don't think about transportation all that much or, or not, not seriously, but the parallel is there. We, we developed industrial agriculture because it was profitable for the people who sold the machines, sold the chemicals, sold the seeds, sold the land and so on to develop industrial agriculture. And so we became a society that depends on industrial agriculture. And the exact same thing is true about cars and highways and our modes of transportation. It was more profitable for people to drive themselves around individually. And so highways were built and, and big auto was subsidized. But it does show a lack of imagination to imagine, to, to, fail, to, to fail to realize that public transportation could work or could have worked equally well, better. And I, I think one of the great accomplishments of 21st century capitalism is that so many people believe there is no alternative. Right. Uh, that, that the way it is that there's something inevitable, there are no other arrangements. 
And I think we each write about and, and I know think about uh, ultra processed food, you know, the food that is increasingly uh, constitutes the global diet, what some people have called the neoliberal or the capitalist diet, foods that are high in fat and sugar and additives. And yet the, uh, the research evidence as I read it is increasingly, it is those very foods that are leading to this terrible burden of diet related diseases and now also contributing to COVID you know, to diabetes and cancer and cardiovascular disease. And to think that there's no alternative to that diet, that we couldn't have another food system that would provide food that would sustain health rather than undermine it, that's crazy. You know, the, 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 the thinking that what we have is all we get uh, is literally crazy because it dooms people to this burden of disease and these stark inequalities. Yeah, the pipe dream is imagining that this system could continue, not that there's an alternative. That there's an alternative is the obvious answer. The, trying to imagine this continuing is, the, is, as you say, the crazy thing. Right. So I wonder if we should uh, jump right into, I, I think in my talks, people ask about a lot, so, so what do we do? And maybe you describe some of the people and organizations and movements that are working to create alternatives in food. Can you talk about that a little and what makes you optimistic? What makes you pessimistic? Yeah, I think I can talk about that. You know, um, my thinking's matured since I finished the book and I, I, haven't, I haven't done a a book that I wanted to finish less. That is, I, I really wanted to keep going, um, but I recognized that um, I didn't want to be one of those kinds of authors who goes 20 years beyond deadline, plus I'm 70, so you know there, there might not be 20 years. Um, but my thinking has evolved and, uh, and I've come to feel that there are, I'm, I'm, I'm in a window of optimism as I think many of us are since the election. And, and I think it, it could be a brief window or it could be a, a window that stays open for a long time. We, we don't know yet. Um, but I've come to think that there are two things that, that are really important. It is, it is, or let's say three. One is that it is, it is important to imagine the future, but it's really not important to understand how we get from here to a place that is utopian or sustainable or whatever, fair, whatever you want to call it. We do need to know what the first steps are. And I think that that's important. And I, and I can talk a little about that in the food world, as I'm sure you can in any number of, in any number of worlds. And then the other thing that's important is to model what, what a better system might look like. So uh, a farmer's market is a, a simple example of a model of, of how things might look, a, pl a place where the supply chain is shortened, transportation is reduced to almost, almost nothing. The people who grow the food benefit from purchases by the people who are actually going to eat the food. The food can be grown well and still, still be profitable. It doesn't, doesn't, um, doesn't poison the environment and so on. Um, a CSA is another form of, of a farmer's market really, but, but most people know that CSA stands for community supported agriculture where uh, eaters pay ahead of time and support farmers regardless of what the crop looks like and, and take what the farmers give them. As a, as a cook, I can add that everybody's cooking is better if you buy the food that your local farmers are growing as opposed to the food that the recipe tells you to go, to go buy. Um, there are other models. Of course, there are people working on, on justice in agriculture, on justice for farm workers, uh, on reducing pesticides in the environment, uh, on reducing agriculture's contribution to climate change and so on. And I think um, being involved in those things, checking out farms that are doing, doing things right, uh, being involved in local labor organizations that support farm workers and restaurant workers for that matter. 
Um, these are all valuable ways of, of modeling and participating. But I think, you know, and as a, as a public health person, I, I know that you see this more often even than I do, but I think that we do a big disservice by discounting the role of government and by, and by uh, putting way too much stress on personal behavior. So people will say, or people will actually believe that you can chop your way to a better food system or chop your way uh, to reducing um, agriculture's impact on climate change. And, and of course you can in a, in a micro fashion, but, but it takes society to make, you take, to make big changes. And, and one of government's roles is, is to protect people from from business to make the kind of changes that we can't make by ourselves, to have vision and see how things can change and in what direction are. And that's that's where I'm temporarily and, and maybe maybe longer term optimistic about what changes can happen. So a few months ago, I I challenged myself to answer this question more intelligently and specifically than I used to, and come up with four or five things that could happen in the near future that would have impact on putting us on the road toward building a better food system. And one of those was actually uh, justice for black farmers. And, and lo and behold, uh, the COVID relief bill included a small but significant uh, $5 billion amount of money to do to pay off the debt of black and other farmers of color, um, outstanding debts on, on USDA backed loans. And this is, this is an example of a, of a good thing happening. Um, and I think there are three or four other things that could happen almost as, I'm not saying there wasn't a struggle to make this happen, there was, but, but three or four other things that could happen pretty easily. And, um, you know, I'm going to ask you the same question. I hope I'm not stepping on your toes, but these are strictly food things. One is eliminating antibiotics, the routine use of antibiotics in the food supply. And, and I think this has been well publicized enough, so I don't need to say anything other than that 80% of the antibiotics in the United States uh, are administered to animals and it's increased antibiotic resistance in humans and, and in bacteria as well. Um, that's something that could happen at the will of FDA. And it could have happened in 2009 when Obama took over as president and it didn't. And it's still low hanging fruit that could change the way that animals are raised. It could change the way that antibiotics are used. It could reduce the impact of, of animal production, production on the environment. And it could do those things very quickly. Similarly, and I'll do this even faster, I think, we could enforce existing regulations and create new ones about carcinogenic pesticides, which endanger not only farm workers, but gardeners and the public at large. Um, we could enforce and further force existing regulations and, and, and introduce new ones on the production of the industrial production of animals, which again, poisons the environment, uh, is horribly unethical. Um, and if it were a transparent system, no one would be buying industrially produced meat or, or very few people would be buying industrially produced meat. And I think the, the next thing I would stress is discouraging the consumption of junk food and encouraging the consumption of fruits and vegetables, but doing that in a way that's not just educational, but in a way that's very real through soda taxes and maybe other measures that would discourage the consumption of soda and other junk food by children, uh, by regulating the way that marketers could literally attack children before they're even able to know the difference between right and wrong and by um, using the funds that resulted from, from taxing soda to subsidize fruits and vegetables and make them uh, distributed more widely to more of, the, more of the population. These are things that can happen like in the next couple of years and, and should 
obviously. And as I said before, put us on the road um, toward seeing what the next steps are toward building a better food system. Not saying, here's how we get from here to having a regenerative agricultural system that produces only good food for everybody, which is a terrific goal. But I can't say how we're going to get there. But I can say what the first few steps we should be taking are. And, and I can also say that they could happen. Those are realistic things, what I just outlined. Right. So, so I, I think uh, my, uh, we're thinking along the same lines. Not surprisingly. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I asked a, a similar but slightly different question, which is looking across the business sectors I was interested in, big tech, transportation, healthcare, food, what are the elements of those practical steps that would allow not only to make progress and, and the phrase I use is you make the road by walking, right? That you, you do one thing at a time and you move forward and you make progress and then you build on those. But what might be an agenda that could bring together the folks working in food, the folks working for universal health care, the folks working uh, to reduce the climate emergency. And some of the things on that list sound very much like what's on your list. So I'll, I'll mention a few. So the first, I think, is to grow the public sector. You know, that one of the characteristics of 21st century capitalism, it looks to shrink the public sector. And in food, as you know, there is a big public sector, right? It, there's uh, SNAP, the food stamp program, there's school food, you know, there are the subsidies to agriculture. And the problem has been that public spending, uh, taxpayer spending, has too often been used to benefit corporations and not to benefit the public good. And we need to be thinking, we activists, social movements, health professionals need to be thinking, what is that public sector and how do we sustain it and grow it? In, in the example you gave from farmers markets, it's the public sector who can make it easy for there to be more farmers markets and more people to use them and also people with lower incomes to use them by getting subsidies. Uh, in, uh, in, in healthcare, I think the, the call for universal healthcare is the acknowledgement that the for-profit motive in healthcare hasn't worked out very well. Mm -hmm. You know, it means we spend more on healthcare than any other country, but we get less for what we spend. And so we need to be saying, what can the public do? And I think the, uh, some of the disasters of the COVID pandemic illustrate uh, what the cost of having uh, a privately controlled uh, healthcare sector. One of the stories that I tell in my book that I found so upsetting was that many nursing homes, before, long before the pandemic, beginning in the 80s and 90s, were bought up by private equity firms because they thought it was a good area for investment, nursing homes and long-term care homes. And what did they do to return their, to increase their return on investment? They cut back staff. And that led to worse outcomes. And what we saw in the COVID pandemic, that profit motive meant many older, many more older people died. Many of the workers in those places got infected. In education, we've seen uh, a, a public sector uh, under attack you know, the growth of charter schools in higher education, you know, which is my day job. Uh, we've seen the growth of these private for-profit universities uh, that, uh, that, that have really misrepresented what they offer to students and led many college students to incur huge debts. Uh, so, I, and I think the second, so, so growing the public sector is something we can do consistently across these different sectors. I think a second uh, common agenda is to strengthen democracy. Part of the reason that we've seen the undermining of public health regulation, regulations like taking antibiotics out of food that the public supports when they understand it, but the pharmaceutical industry and the uh, petrochemical industry and the agricultural supply industries have amassed uh, a, a huge amount of power 
over the last 20, 30 years. And they've used that power to undermine public health and environmental protection. We need to rebalance that so that more of the, uh, of the political power, of the democratic power, returns to ordinary voters, returns to the people who are affected by those antibiotics in our meat and in our water and in so many other places. The third, uh, I think, common uh, plank of, across these sectors is to uh, return control of science and technology to the public and to people and to make it harder for corporations to wrest control of new developments. Again, we've seen that in COVID. Yes, it's wonderful that we have vaccines and that they happen relatively quickly, but with the pharmaceutical corporations controlling the deployment of that, we've seen almost no one in Africa, Asia, and Latin America has been able to get vaccinated uh, because the companies insist on selling them to the wealthy who can afford to pay for them, the wealthy governments in this case, who can afford to pay for them. And the final point uh, I want to make that I uh, that comes from my perspective as being a public health person, I think health is a really uh, powerful tool in the same way that food is for starting to bring together some of the movements that have been mostly working separately in this country, the climate movement, the labor movement, the women's movement, uh, the Black Lives Matter, uh, the dreamers, uh, and that as long as each of these movements move separately, and as long as people in power are able to use racism and sexism to divide people, uh, I think it's gonna be hard to sustain the victories uh, that we win. And so by looking to create a framework, and I think healthier lives, you know, healthier day-to-day -day lives and a healthier planet, those are strong ideas for bringing together uh, people who are now uh, working separately. And I wonder if that resonates with you and whether you think that is also true in food. I mean, of course I do. And um, I think that one thing that's interesting, particularly interesting about food that I, I don't think you would say about all of the other sectors you're describing, but food, it, food is expensive. It's expensive to do agriculture and it's, and uh, whether you do it well or badly, it costs money. And, and what's happening, um, what happens with food now is that we, that is the government is mostly subsidizing the production of, let's say bad food, hyper-processed food, food that can be non-nutritious or anti-nutritious, but it's equally possible to subsidize the production of good food. And so I wonder if the, of the, of the four or five points you just made, I wonder if strengthening democracy isn't the, the key, the most important, because how do you get to a place? It's not, this is not only about education. This is about power. And how do you get to a place where the people who are affected by these decisions have the power over, over what these decisions are. When I, to me, one of the things we had talked about, talking about that we're not talking about, but, but um, to me, one of the things that I learned in looking at the history of the food system is that there are three or four global turning points in the history of agriculture um, at which things could have developed differently. And there was no one there to exercise, there was no democracy at, these, at this point, there was no one to really exercise intent or to say, as I keep insisting, the, to ask the important question, what is food for? What do we want a food system to look like? We can answer that question. It's, it's not just an intellectual exercise. We can say what a good food system should look like the question really becomes, how do we get there? And that is about strengthening democracy. And, and um, you know, the more you talk about food, and, and this is exactly like all the other sectors you talk about, 
the more you talk about food, the more you wind up having to grapple with all the big issues because they are so interrelated. They are uh, so deeply run by our economic system and only potentially changed by our political system. And, and that's the recognition is that this, these things have to be changed with intent and with that intent have to co- has to come power and power comes from voting, voting reform, organizing, working on local levels and so on. It, it always comes down to that. Yeah. I wonder if in a couple of minutes we should uh, t- take some questions and hear reactions from the folks who are listening today. And uh, I, I, I wonder uh, if before we do that, you can point to a few of the organizations that you think are models for combining food and democracy and environment, uh, some organizations that people might want to look to for understanding how to put those pieces together? Well, you know, I could name 50 different organizations, but I, it's easier to name one organization, which is called HEAL, and HEAL stands for Health, Environment, Agriculture, Labor, um, and it's technically called the HEAL Food Alliance. It's based in Oakland, and it is an alliance of other alliances, of food workers' alliances, of, of people who work in, in nutrition, of people who work in agroecology, regenerative farming, um, people who defend immigrant workers, uh, fight racism in agriculture and the food system and so on. Literally an organization of 50 or maybe at this point more organizations in food. And and um, that's exactly, I think that's part of what we're talking about here is unifying the struggles and recognizing that the agricultural the struggle for good agriculture is a struggle around public health. It is a struggle around labor. It is a struggle about income inequality. And no matter what issue you pick in food, you're going to find that that its tentacles reach into every other issue in food and that we need, uh, to me, it seems like first unified food organizations, but very soon thereafter, food organizations allied with public health organizations public health and food organizations allied with environmental and climate organizations. These these links are so easy to see, maybe a little harder to see is the link to immigrant organizations, the link to women's power organizations, to uh, black power organizations like BLM and so on down the line. All of these often siloed struggles have to come together into one, one more powerful one. Right, with a clear vision. So uh, to remind uh, participants, you can write questions for us or reactions in the chat, and maybe we can move into the uh, Q&A section of our discussion now. Yeah, thanks to both of you. This is a very compelling uh, conversation. Uh, we don't have any questions from the audience uh, as yet, but um, maybe I can just get us started off. One of the things I was kind of thinking about um, one of the things I do think about when we talk about making food slower, I guess, is the term that's used. Um, It does change, you know, how, how our social structures kind of are. And I wonder if you've thought, thought about um, what some of the social impacts would be to um, spending more time and energy on food, on the uh, production of it. And, you know, or am I kind of overblowing, you know, how dramatic that shift would be? Right. I, I can start with that. And, and Mark, I'm sure you'll have things to say, too. Uh, one of my colleagues talks about uh, non-food food policies. And your question makes me think about that. So what would it take to have more time to cook? First of all, you w- would not. It, it's very hard to do that if you have. Uh, two people who support a family each having to work two jobs or more than one job. And so you would need to be sure it's very hard to uh, 
to be able to focus on uh, preparing healthier food and having more time if you don't earn enough income to get healthy food. Uh, it's very hard to focus on food uh, if it's hard to get childcare. And so we need to look at what are the range of things that people need for a decent life, affordable housing, uh, uh, decent health care. And when you provide people with the basic necessities of life, what, what should be everyone's right in the wealthiest society in the world, uh, then people can sp spend time on thinking. Uh, someone who uh, worked on food policy uh, for the United Nations was the coordinator of the right to food uh, Olivier de Chute said something I thought was really smart. He said, you Americans always get it wrong. You think it's about giving people money for food. It's about uh, putting money in people's pockets so they can decide what they want to spend it on. And if people have more money, they will spend it on healthier food. Uh, and that's really why the huge uh, income inequalities that have resulted from 21st century capitalism, where a handful of uh, millionaires and billionaires control a huge portion of the wealth and the rest of the population has almost nothing. That makes it harder for people to have decent lives with decent food, to get decent healthcare, decent education, and so on. So looking at the tax policies, also food policies that contribute to income inequality. Uh, I'll, I'll stop my riff on that and turn it back to you, Mark, to see if you have something to say about that. Well, I would, I would just say that, um, once again, I think it's important for us to take a step back and ask what food is for and, um, and, and what it means for us to be able to feed ourselves. There's a, uh, an increased interest in farming on the part of young people, but there's not land particularly for them to farm on. We don't support farmers. We haven't used uh, the technology of the last hundred years in order to figure out how to make farming more sustainable, in order to figure out how to make farming more possible for people who are not farming thousands of acres, but are farming dozens or hundreds of acres, how to restore the dignity uh, to farming that it once had. All of our food issues really are based on whether people have a right to good, adequate, nutritious, fair, affordable, and so on food. But none of that can happen until our food supply produces that kind of food. So it, it really begins with, you know, to go back to your question, Candace, about, about slowness or pace, it begins with understanding and having regard for land, the earth, nature, where food really comes from and what its role is in life. There's nothing more important. And yet we treat it casually. casually. We, put, we leave its production in the hands of people who really don't care about the quality of the food they produce. All they care about is how much money can be made by producing that food. That puts the interest of farmers second, and it puts the interests of eaters a distant third. Um, and, and we really have to turn that around. If there's, if there's profit to be made in food, that's okay, but that cannot be the priority. The priority has to be, how do we produce it? How do we treat the earth? How do we treat ourselves? How do we eat? Right, what, what, are, what do we value as a society? That seems to be something that we need to look at ourselves and really question and, and change. Um, I do have a couple of questions coming in. Um, uh, let's see, one from Amy. I imagine there will be a counter arguments to taxing things like soda and junk food as something that is targeting particular segments of the population. How might you counter the, this counter? Um, and then she follows up, um, how might you counter the counter argument that taxing soda and junk food targets already marginalized communities? Well, I think the first thing to say is that the soda companies target poor and vulnerable communities. They're advertising of uh, food that uh, is 
uh, products, you know, take sugary beverages, soda, that are demonstrated to be the uh, single largest contributor to diabetes, heart disease, cancer, uh, obesity, that is the uh, precursor of many of those conditions. And who are they advertising heavily to? Uh, black and brown children and young people, uh, black and Latino uh, and immigrant communities. So they're the ones doing the targeting and the uh, health burden of those uh, products is imposed on poor communities. And so the uh, tax on sugary beverages uh, is an attempt to uh, re-internalize the ability of soda and big food companies to sh shift the health costs of their sickening products onto poor people. And so I think uh, making them pay. Now, I believe there are some particular ways of doing sugary beverages taxes that make them fairer and more ethical. One is that the revenues from them should go back to health, should go to supporting uh, healthy food in low-income communities, should go to uh, uh, ensuring that there are water fountains in public places, in schools, and so on. Uh, so I've, I've heard that argument that it is uh, targeting the poor, but I really think it's uh, <laughs> the, the starting point is the targeting by these industries. I just add, and, and Nick is the expert on this, so I, I, don't, I don't have a lot to add. Um, but I would just add that that junk food I think junk food is the tobacco of the 21st century and, and junk food manufacturers are following the playbook uh, Nick's written about this extensively that was created by the tobacco companies and, and industry will always push back against public health measures that, that it sees as, as threatening its profits. And this is a, another example of that. Um, the most surprising thing I found in the course of writing this book is that the majority of calories in the United States now come from ultra-processed food. So uh, if you acknowledge the science that ultra-processed food is responsible for uh, a great many chronic diseases, and you acknowledge the science that chronic disease is the leading cause of premature death in the United States, far outweighing COVID even in 2020, and certainly presumably in the years following 2020, then you have to acknowledge that, that junk food is one of the greatest threats to public health. And that if the majority of our calories come from junk food, someone has to eat those calories. This is not a question of behavior change. This is a question of what food, what is in the food supply. And what determines what's in the food supply is policy and agriculture to, the, to a great extent. And again, I, I know I sound repetitive here, we are not making intelligent uh, eater first decisions about what agriculture and public policy around food look like. Um, Chris has a question here. Um, you, you talked about um, some maybe maybe a little more national policies that might be um, changed. Uh, but he's asking what kinds of local issues are most important to support uh, making food and farmer farming better? Uh, what, what, what should we be looking at in our, in our, in where we are? Well, why don't I answer that a little bit on food, Nick, and then you can talk about things beyond food and, and local issues. Um, I think that local agriculture is important. I think that urban agriculture, not that it is super productive or is gonna change the supply most, much, but as an educational tool and as a society building tool, as a tool to build power is important. School lunches are super important. Um, purchasing by municipalities and by big institutions is something we can all have an impact on. That really matters if you decide that you're the food that your school system or your hospital or your local prison or whatever is bought uh, in a principled matter instead of 
randomly or, or through kickbacks, even worse. Um, that's an important, those are all important local issues. Um, I, you know, it's, it's worth pointing out that, that um, five of the 10 worst paying jobs in the United States, and by some counts more, are in the food system. And some of those jobs, uh, the payment for some of those jobs can be affected on a local and a state, a state basis. So um, Oakland eliminated the tipped wage years ago. That happened in, in one city. Uh, many states, including many um, red states, have raised the statewide minimum wage, which, which has included uh, agriculture and tipped agricultural and tipped workers. So, so these kinds of changes that eventually should and presumably will become national often start on the local level. Yes, and I'll, I'll maybe talk about two uh, things that I think are both food and go beyond food. One that that are very much local issues. Uh, one is to create. Uh, spaces and places that are free of commercial influence, places where we can take our children and not worry that someone's going to try and sell them something that will make them sick. Uh, this has been used around food, it's been used around alcohol, it's been used around tobacco, and it has included uh, schools, public parks. Uh, London uh, banned the marketing of junk food in their subway, in their mass transit system. That's an example of a decision a locality can make. We wanna protect our children. We wanna keep our children free of the predatory marketing that tries to sell them uh, products that will make them sick or put them at risk of premature death. And the second, I wanted to come back to that stronger uh, public sector notion. Uh, in the, in the case of food in Brazil, many towns and localities subsidize restaurants that provide free, low cost, healthy meals to whoever wants it. It's an alternative to fast food. Uh, we used to have public markets in New York uh, and they closed down to be replaced by commercial markets. Public markets can put a priority in health and that can be true for a variety of products, including food. Uh, many localities have also taken uh, forward thinking steps on transportation, made it easier for people to bike, to walk, uh, to take mass transit, and therefore both reduce pollution and uh, reduce the car culture and the dependence on cars. So those I think are a few of the things that uh, local activists and local governments and local mayors and city councils and county executives can do to make their place healthier. Great. Well, thank you both so much. Um, it's, give, it's given us a lot to think about. It sounds like your, both of your books have a lot of really helpful information. And um, I want to thank the audience. Um, thank you for all your questions. We didn't get to all of them, but um, if you are interested in purchasing either of the books uh, being discussed tonight, um, I want to encourage you to use the links in the chat to, to buy from our local bookstore, Third Place Books, and we can support them. Um, but thank you both so much for staying up with us. I know you're, you're coming in from uh, three or four hours uh, ahead of us. So thank you so much for um, presenting and bringing this to us. Um, hopefully next time we have you, we can have you live uh, and in person. But until then, I, I hope you stay safe and have a great night. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm hoping for that too.